Just like glycolysis, the process of gluconeogenesis must be closely regulated by the cells of our body. And what's even more interesting is these two processes, so glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, are actually regulated in a reciprocal fashion. And what that means is when one of these processes takes place in the cell of our body, the other process is essentially turned off. Now the question is why? Why is it that these two processes cannot take place in the cell at the same exact moment in time? Well actually they can take place at the same exact moment in time if we examine energy value. So there's actually no energy barrier that is actually inhibiting these two processes from taking place at the same exact moment in time. Why? Well because remember both of these processes, gluconeogenesis and glycolysis, release a certain amount of energy in the cell. And that means they are both spontaneous exergonic reactions. So if we simply sum up these two reactions, they will create a net exergonic reaction. Now, what actually doesn't allow these two steps to take place at the same exact moment in time are these special allosteric enzymes, as we'll discuss in this lecture. So the cell actually uses allosteric enzymatic regulation to essentially prevent both of these processes from taking place at the same exact moment in time. But the natural question might be why? Well, the answer lies in the following explanation. So, Recall that in gluconeogenesis, even though we release a certain amount of energy, it's an exergonic process, we use up four ATP molecules and two GTP molecules. While in the glycolysis process, we produce a net amount of two ATP molecules. So if we sum up these two reactions, we'll see that the sum actually uses up two ATP molecules and two GTP molecules. And what that means is, when glycolysis takes place at the same exact time as gluconeogenesis, we're not actually going to form any ATP molecules. In fact, we're going to use up these ATP molecules. And that kind of defeats the purpose of glycolysis. And so that's pretty much why these two processes don't take place at the same exact moment in time inside our cell. Now, the next question is, how is this actually achieved? How can our cells regulate this process? How can the cells actually turn off one process while turning on the other process? Well, it's a result of what I mentioned just a moment ago. It's the fact that our cells have these enzymes, allosteric enzymes, that can be used to regulate this process. And there are two points along the pathway, so point number one and point number two, where we have allosteric enzymes that can be used to basically regulate the pathways of gluconeogenesis and glycolysis. So remember, gluconeogenesis uses pyruvate molecules to form glucose, while glycolysis uses glucose to form the pyruvate molecule. So going this way, is glycolysis, but going this way is gluconeogenesis. Okay, so let's begin by imagining that inside our cell of the body, we have lots of ATP molecules. So the energy value, the energy charge in the cell is high. Now, remember that the energy charge of a cell is simply the ratio of ATP molecules to AMP molecules. And so if the energy charge of the cell is high, we have a large ATP level compared to the AMP. And if we have many ATP molecules in the cell, will the cell actually need to make any more ATP molecules? And the answer is no. If there are many ATP molecules, the cell doesn't actually need to form any more ATP molecules. And in this particular case, glycolysis will essentially be shut off. Now, because we have an excess amount of ATP, these ATP molecules can now be used by gluconeogenesis. Remember, it uses up four ATP and two GTP. And so we can undergo gluconeogenesis and use that excess amount of ATP to actually produce glucose and then use that glucose to form glycogen. So basically to form the glycogen storages in our cells. 
Now, what exactly regulates this process? So again, in our cell, we have high energy charge and that will favor the process of gluconeogenesis. So let's see how this process is actually activated when we have lots of ATP in our cell. Well, let's begin with this first molecule here. So this is our pyruvate carboxylase, which is the enzyme that catalyzes step one in gluconeogenesis. And we have a molecule known as acetyl coenzyme A that essentially activates pyruvate carboxylate. It, it essentially increases its efficiency of converting pyruvate into oxaloacetate. So remember, in our discussion of this step, we said that the acetyl coenzyme A is needed to actually allow the binding between the carbon dioxide and the biotin component of that pyruvate carboxylase. Now, acetyl coenzyme A is actually a molecule that is needed for the citric acid cycle to actually take place. And so if we have plenty of acetyl coenzyme A molecules, that means we have plenty of molecules that are needed for the citric acid cycle. And the citric acid cycle doesn't need any more acetyl coenzymes A and pyruvates ultimately are used to produce that acetyl coenzyme A. And so what this tells us is a high amount of, C, uh, of acetyl coenzyme A basically means we don't want to produce any more pyruvate molecules. And so we can use the pyruvate molecules to form the glucose. And so this step will essentially increase in its rate. Now, by the way, anything in blue basically means it's an activator. Anything in red basically means it's an inhibitor. Now, Let's move on to this point here. So what will happen here is the citrate molecule, which is an intermediate in the process of the citric acid cycle, basically activates fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So again, the, citric mo the citrate molecule is essentially an agent that tells the cell that we have plenty of molecules to actually go around to use in the citric acid cycle. And so we don't want to produce any more intermediates in the citric acid cycle. And so we don't want to produce any more pyruvates. And that implies that pyruvates can now be used to form the glucose, which in turn can be used to actually replenish our glycogen stores in the cells of our body. So these two enzymes are essentially activated and that allows this process of gluconeogenesis to actually take place at the same exact moment in time when we have a high energy charge value, lots of ATP relative to AMP, then this process will be turned off. How will it be turned off? So let's begin in this stage here. So stage number one, by the way, is the interconversion of fructose 1,6-phosphate and fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. <coughs> and the enzyme that catalyzes this step in glycolysis is phosphofructokinase. Now, phosphofructokinase, as we discussed previously, is inhibited by large amounts of ATP. And so ATP will bind onto an allosteric site of phosphofructokinase, inhibiting its activity. At the same exact time, if this is inhibited, then the, phosphofructokine, uh, the, the fructose 6-phosphate cannot be transformed into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And so this concentration will build up. Now, as this concentration builds up, because these two molecules are essentially at equilibrium, not exactly, but they're pretty much at equilibrium, then as we build up this concentration, that causes a buildup in the glucose 6-phosphate. And as this builds up, the glucose 6-phosphate, G6P, where this is G6 and P, basically goes on to inactivate hexokinase. So by inactivating phosphofructokinase, we also inactivate the hexokinase by the pathway that I just discussed. Now, let's discuss H plus ions and citrates. Now, in skeleton muscle cells, when the rate of glycolysis will exceed the rate of oxidative phosphorylation that takes place in the mitochondria, there will be a buildup of lactic acid. So as a result of lactic acid fermentation, and so we will increase the H plus ions. And that will also inhibit the activity of phosphofructokinase. 
Now, I put a star next to this because this is not true for liver cells. Because in liver cells, the H plus ions don't really affect phosphofructokinase. And that's because in the liver cells, they have the ability to actually transform lactate into pyruvate. And so the H plus ions don't affect the phosphofructokinases found inside liver cells. But the citric molecules do affect phosphofructokinase in liver cells. So in liver cells, we have the citrate basically goes on to bind onto phosphofructokinase to basically tell that molecule to stop the process of glycolysis. Why? Well, because if we have plenty of ATP molecules, that also means we have plenty of pyruvate molecules. And pyruvate, under aerobic conditions, ultimately goes on to the citric acid cycle to form citrate. So if we have lots of citrate molecules, we don't want to form any more pyruvates. And so that goes on to phosphofructokinase in activating, inhibiting the phosphofructokinase. Now, let's move on to pyruvate kinase. So this molecule is the enzyme that catalyzes the final step in glycolysis. In the same way that ATP inhibits phosphofructokinase, ATP also inhibits pyruvate kinase. But in addition, because pyruvate, as we'll see in a future lecture, is actually used to form alanine, if we have plenty of ATP, that means we have plenty of pyruvate molecules. And so we have plenty of alanine molecules. And the alanine, the increase in alanine, will basically go back and create a negative feedback loop that will inhibit the action of pyruvate kinase. Now, in liver cells, unlike skeleton muscle cells, in liver cells, the pyruvate kinase exists in the L-isozyme form. And the L-isozyme form of liver cells is also affected by phosphorylation. So in liver cells, not in skeleton muscle cells, the pyruvate kinase can also be inhibited by the process of phosphorylation. And so I put a star here because this is only true for liver cells. It's not really true for skeleton muscle cells. In the same exact way, this citrate only inhibits the phosphofructokinase in liver cells, and the H plus only really inhibits the phosphofructokinase in skeleton muscle cells. So we see that when we have plenty of ATP molecules inside our cells, we don't want to form any more ATP molecules. In fact, we want to use up some of those ATP molecules to replenish our glycogen stores. And so glu uh, glycolysis is turned off, but gluconeogenesis is turned on so that we can use things like amino acids and glycerol molecules and lactate molecules to form the glucose from the pyruvate. And then we can take the glucose and transform it into the glycogen molecule to basically replenish our storage of glycogen. So, when the cell has a high ATP concentration relative to AMP, this tells the cell to stop producing ATP via glycolysis and begin generating glucose via gluconeogenesis to store it as glycogen. And under these conditions, glycolysis is halted and gluconeogenesis is activated. And so we basically describe the same exact things I described just a moment ago. So in the case of glycolysis, we have Phosphofructokinase is inhibited by ATP in skeleton muscles by H+, and in liver cells by citrate. The hexokinase is in turn inactivated by this buildup of the glucose 6-phosphate. And pyruvate kinase is inhibited by ATP, alanine, and in liver cells by the process of phosphorylation. At the same time, this is activated as a result of the activation of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate by the citrate molecule that we basically discussed here. And the pyruvate carboxylase, the first step of this gluconeogenic pathway, it is activated by acetyl-coenzyme A. Now, let's switch our discussion to supposing that we have a low concentration of ATP in our cells. So if we have low amounts of ATP relative to AMP, what that means is our energy charge of the cell will be low. And under these conditions, we want to be able to generate a net amount of ATP. We don't want to use up ATP. And so in this case, glycolysis will essentially be activated while gluconeogenesis will be inhibited.
Now, how is this actually regulated? Well, once again, let's suppose, let's begin with gluconeogenesis and let's see how gluconeogenesis is actually inactivated when we have little ATP in our cells. So let's begin at this stage and this stage here. So essentially stage number two. So we have adenosine diphosphate inhibits not only pyruvate carboxylase, but also the PEP carboxykinase. Remember, PEP carboxykinase transforms oxaloacetate into phosphoenylpyruvate. Now, because we have essentially lots of AMP in our cell, the AMP goes on to bind onto the fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase and that inactivates this step here. Not only that, but fructose 2,6-bisphosphate also inactivates fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now, don't worry too much about this molecule here, the F2,6-BP. We're going to focus on that much more in the next lecture when we discuss how glucose levels in the blood actually activate or inactivate these two processes. Now, what happens on this end? So this inactivates the gluconeogenic process, but